the Nasdaq set a record high. The flip side, yep, the data scandals continue to pile up for one tech company, Facebook. Now, I'll be speaking with its head of product partnerships who's responded to the latest allegations. You'll also hear this hour from the head of an airline company, uh, and he is at IATA, and the CEO of Qatar Airways, who's been dealing with a blockade against his home country for a year now. First, though, Facebook is forced to defend itself once again from claims that it's been, yeah, oversharing all of that data you're feeding Facebook just weeks after it tried to draw a line under the Cambridge Analytica scandal. A New York Times investigation says Facebook shared data with some of the most powerful tech firms on the planet. Think about it. This is everything from your smartphone to Amazon, and it claims that the social network forged relationships with about 60 companies. As I said, that includes Apple, BlackBerry, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung. In return, Facebook allegedly shared users' education history, relationship status, work, religion, political leaning, don't get me started on that, and upcoming events. Now, the claims raise new questions about whether CEO Mark Zuckerberg was right in telling Congress that users have, and quote here, complete control over their data. Face over their data. Facebook disagrees with the New York Times, saying, quote, these partners signed agreements that prevented people's Facebook information from being used for any other purpose than to recreate Facebook-like experiences. We're going to explain that in a minute. We are not aware, Facebook continues, of any abuse by these companies. Now, those comments were written by Ime Archibong, Facebook's Vice President of Product Partnerships, and he joins me now live. I can't thank you enough for being here because I think the questions are best answered by you. You had some clear problems with the New York Times um, investigation. Let's get to it. What do you deny categorically from that uh, investigation? And I don't mean about excuses or explaining to me what apps were like a decade ago. What are your problems with that investigation? What was wrong? Yeah, we're, we're fundamentally talking about two different things here, ultimately. I mean, you, you just mentioned apps were different a decade ago, and I actually do think that that context does matter. Because I think what you find, if you would rewind back to the days for the folks that had early mobile devices, is if you are an Apple user and you are also a YouTube lover, you know, the YouTube app was built by Apple until 2012. Uh, so similarly, when we were looking at how we could extend our mission, making sure that we gave as many people as possible around the world the power to connect, you know, we didn't want to limit ourselves to just the platforms that we could build for. We know okay, we but Ime, I gotta, okay, from I've, got to, to I've got to interrupt you there because I know that you have very good points on this, but I can tell you right now, mm. all I hear are excuses. The point is, how did this data go to these 60 companies and how were they able to use it? I think it's, that's a good point. I think it's actually important to be very clear here is that this data wasn't transferred to these 60 companies. If anything, Facebook, like many other folks in the industry, made the means available for these devices to build what we're calling Facebook-like experiences so that, yes, a BlackBerry user in Nigeria had access to uh, Facebook in the same way that uh, a Symbian user in a different part of the world might have access to Facebook. It was just really important for us to ensure that as many people as possible had access to this experience that we thought were improving Okay, but they lives. also had access to data. I know that we've spoken spoken to app developers who say that they get data that they didn't even know they were going to be that they were going to be uh, that was going to be shared just in developing this I mean I think just to get back to the crux of the matter in terms of this data okay we understand why you did it and how you did it we didn't have uh, an apps on the phone that you could easily access Facebook I totally understood you may but where are we going with this in the terms of you must have thought that there was something wrong because in 2015 you started to wind up all these contracts no, not at all. If anything, I think it's a point to be very clear here is that data wasn't shared. So, for example, if I was a BlackBerry user and I was trying to connect to this application, I had to sign in, download the Facebook app, log in with my credentials, and I got the Facebook experience in just in the same way that I would on an iPhone or an Android device. Friends and the data that they were then sharing with me would only be surfaced to me in the same way that it, they would expect on a desktop experience if I was accessing Facebook that way. So to be like really clear here that data wasn't necessarily shared. There were strong privacy concerns controls that were in place on Facebook proper and all of these device integrations respected those same privacy controls. Have to you your point about why we started, oh sorry, go ahead. Uh, sorry, you go ahead, and then I'll, I'll follow up on something. Oh, no. Yeah, I said to your point about why we started winding these things down, I think, you know, macro trends speak for themselves, right? We started these integrations back in a day when, A, there weren't that many folks that were accessing our experiences on mobile devices. That clearly has changed over the course of the last decade. A lot of these devices are legacy devices. So, yes, while 
Um, it was important to be on the BlackBerry and be on some of these feature phone experiences. Smartphones have gotten cheaper. Places like Indonesia, Nigeria, India, Bangladesh, a lot of these countries where these experiences are being uh, used uh, are now having smartphone okay. devices that have kind of proper Facebook I mean, I have to challenge you on something, though, because even with the Cambridge Analytica scandal, what we learned was that Facebook did not know what was going on with some of its data. So I'm asking you right now, how many of these 60 companies have you audited to know that they're uh, has been no illicit use or even marketing or strategy use of that data that Facebook had. So again, this is a good distinction to draw. So for the, for the platform experience and developers like Kogan uh, and Cambridge Analytica, there was standard terms that they would accept that they actually got access to, you know, data to make the Facebook experiences or social experiences they were interested in. For these device partners, for these 60 device partners, we worked closely with them up front. These partnerships were tight i.e. we had engineers working with them, we talked through their product experiences, ultimately really wanted to make Facebook-like experiences, and that, that consistency was really so important you trusted to us them. from the get-go. You, you trusted them the way you yes. trusted Cambridge Analytica? No, very, very different experiences again. So these 60 partners, we worked closely with them. I mean, they're the names that you've talked about before. Uh, we had engineers sitting with them, with our engineers sitting with us. We talked through product experiences. And again, these are just like, they're fundamentally very different experiences than something like a Kogan application or even an application like, uh, you know, Spotify on our platform who are using our open APIs. Okay, I mean, you, can, you can understand that if you're a Facebook user and you're sitting here, you're still not convinced. And the reason you're not convinced is what came before because of Cambridge Analytica. And I know everyone can understand why you did it, but the point is, have you or will you audit those 60 companies to make sure that nothing untoward has happened with any of that data? Because even though you deny that the New York Times is right about sharing the friends data, it looks kind of creepy right now. Not at all. I mean, we'll, so we'll definitely spend some time with these partners understanding the experiences, but the, the bottom line is that we have since day one with them, and we have continually at different cadences with them across the, you know, really the last decade that we've been working with them to extend these Facebook-like experiences. Okay, you said you spend some time. Is that auditing, people. though? Can you guarantee your Facebook users that absolutely these 60 companies have not done anything they're not supposed to do with that data? We have not detected any misuse of these data, of, so of data from these all experiences yet. We haven't, we haven't done a formal audit if you want to, uh, you know, uh, frame it that way, but we spent time with these folks since day one for the last decade. We'll spend some time understanding the experiences, especially as we're winding them down. We've already shut down 22 of them that we've paid publicly, and we're going to continue to wind them down over the course of the next couple, uh, you know, uh, time. You know, our Dylan Byers, who follows these things on CNN Money, you know, says that, look, the basic rule is tell the truth, tell it all, tell it early, tell it yourself. You now have U.S government legislators saying, huh, I'm not sure, so sure Mark Zuckerberg told the whole truth and nothing but the truth to Congress. This can't come at a good time in terms of having people question why, how their data is used on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, everything that Mark said uh, in D.C. was unequivocally true, right? And the reason why I've made myself available and the reason why I think that we've been kind of very frank and very quick to come back is that we do believe that what we did here is good. There's, we haven't detected any misuse of these experiences. And ultimately, uh, you know, we announced back in April that we were winding down some of these experiences because uh, of the, the fact that they're just they, the, the people that are using them make up a, a smaller portion of the overall Facebook community these days, and it's a good time to make a healthy transition. So you're saying you would do it all over again, because if I hear you, you're stopping these relationships because they're technologically obsolete, not because you, was, you thought there was anything right. wrong with these 60 companies using right. the data. So you would do it all that over is, again. That is absolutely right. In the same way that if there was means and ways that people were getting connected to people that we didn't feel like we were part of those device experiences, we would look to try to figure out how we could extend those Facebook experiences. And me personally, which I shared, my, my, my extended family is in Nigeria. There is no way that I would have known cousins, aunts, okay. and uncles if I <laughs> hadn't connected ag again, with them via Facebook. I, I, and yeah. I understand what you're saying, but again, it just sounds to users like excuses. I mean, we're going to have to leave it there, but please, uh, when we have these questions, we so appreciate you having, our, having you on. It is best to hear it from Thank Facebook you for having us directly. On. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. For having us. Now, given this, Facebook shares fell slightly, only slightly, brought, uh, bucking that broader market trend, though. You have to say it was a good day for tech besides Facebook. Uh, over we go now to the Quest Means Business Trading Post. Uh, they tell me I have to do this. Dow was up. The Nasdaq hit a record. Uh, what is interesting about this is, yes, number 16. Watch this. And again, as we were talking to analysts earlier um, on Wall Street, you know, they're saying that, look, tech is back. 
it's back here to stay. No one is down on the tech companies right now. Now, this is the first record, though, in three months, and it is because of those stellar earnings and some of the stellar earnings growth that we're going to see. Now, Apple, Apple and Microsoft, they're battling to become, get this, trillion dollar giants. Today, that all comes down to one thing, famously expressed by Steve Ballmer. Developers, 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 developers. Yes! Oh my gosh, isn't that a great tech televangelist point there? That was Steve Ballmer, in case you missed it. It was developers. Apple and Microsoft create the phones, the operating system, and iCloud platforms. The developers create the apps that you and I use. Better apps from the developers mean better sales for Apple and Microsoft. Now, to Apple first and its developers conference today. Apple showed off new operating systems for computers, watches, and phones. They include new augmented reality features and ways to combat smartphone addiction. Yeah, you guessed that, ways to actually get off your phone. So Apple is trying to get developers to build apps for Apple platforms. That's what Microsoft was doing so long ago, 18 years ago, when Steve Ballmer was jumping around all sweaty on that stage. Now, Microsoft, though, is taking a different approach, buying the tools developers already use. GitHub is the biggest of the bunch. Developers use GitHub to store their code and interact with each other. It has 28 million users, that's a lot. Microsoft, Facebook, and Google all use it. Microsoft thinks it's worth more than $7 billion. That's what it will pay. The deal is Microsoft's biggest step yet to repair relations with the open source community. Now, the courtship is paying off. Microsoft has grown to $774 billion company. But you guessed it, Apple is still winning the race. It's worth $954 billion. Yes, well on its way to becoming that trillion dollar comp company. Daniel Ives is head of tech research at GBH Insights. Beyond that great piece of screaming tape we had from Steve Ballmer, you know, this is really um, Microsoft coming back from what they thought was going to be the issue of proprietary. It's all ours. It's all us. We will develop an in-house and we will make money off of it to going full bore right back into open source. Yeah, I mean, it speaks in the Dell. I mean, part of why the market cap's done what it has is because every single step from cloud to really shutting down some of the hardware mobile side to now going open source with the acquisition. I mean, that's really been the success of Microsoft. That this is a company, Redmond's massively changed, gotten the developers on, and really with cloud computing front and center, that's why the stocks really, you know, call it tripled, you know, since that speech. And I think, you know, what you're seeing today is really a battle for the developer. You saw it at WWDC with Apple, Microsoft clearly in a position of strength. And I think that's really the future. I mean, for Apple, it's really about software. But if you look what Microsoft's done, they went from core proprietary windows to now cloud computing and open source. And I think it just speaks to the open mindset in Redmond and part of why the success we've seen from Microsoft. It does it lead to better tech, though. And I think, the, and, and will it also propel these companies to better profits? Because you still think of it as, you know, the 300-pound gorilla against the 300-pound gorilla. You know, as they fight it out, is there enough room for everyone? I mean, Apple today created so much hype, and they, they really target these developer conferences. Yeah, I mean, look, it's a big enough ocean, especially for these two boats, and I think many. I mean, I think what you're seeing across tech, you've seen it with Alphabet, you see it with Microsoft, you see it with Facebook, now you see it with Apple. It, it's really about the software piece. I mean, Apple, for the foreseeable future, it's about iPhones. I mean, iPhones is the key. It's the mass, vast majority of profits. But when you look at software, for them, called 50 billion of revenues are going to come from software services yes. by 2020. <laughs> That's really the key for Apple right now. It's like, what's going to be that second, third growth sort of step here? And I think what, what we've seen now is really a battle for the developers. And almost really, it's the next paradigm of technology that we're seeing in Silicon Valley in terms of the software piece. And I think that's why Apple wants to make sure that they're not left behind. I think that's what you saw today 
uh, in terms of uh, the developer conference? There's barely a developer out there that's not agnostic about this. I mean, they have really dogmatic opinions about where all this is going. Where do you think it's going in terms of who's one out here and what it means for the way we use our phones and the way we use our computers, whether it's Microsoft or Apple? Yeah, I think it's, it's going to be a sort of balance. I mean, ultimately, what makes Microsoft who they are is Windows, is their proprietary technology. But I think, look, they need, they can shun the open source community. I think that's what you've sort of seen today. And ultimately, I think the success, it's going to be, it's not just a one winner takes all. I think it's going to be Apple on the iPhone side. I think on the software side, if you look not just on mobile, but on the enterprise and on cloud, Microsoft Nadella is the clear winner. I mean, he has had the golden touch really changed that organization. I think it just shows the 180 degree change that you've seen in Microsoft. And Apple wants to make sure on the software side, as you're seeing a more mature iPhone cycle, software is gonna be the key. Ultimately, it could be content, but really right now it's about software and services. And, that, and I think today was a pivotal day for technology. And I think symbolically, obviously new highs, but Microsoft and Apple really two of the you know, frontiers, you know, leading us to where we are. And Facebook showing us where the pitfalls could be. <laughs> Daniel, thanks so much. Really thanks appreciate for you coming me. in. And tonight, CNN Money's Lori Siegel will have an exclusive interview with Apple Chief Executive Tim Cook that will air in four hours from now on Anderson Cooper 360. And of course, you will see it right here on Tuesday's Quest Means Business. Now, a steady day for the Dow, which held on, I was kind of surprised, to those healthy gains. It closed up nearly 180 points. Investors are shrugging off concerns about a trade war. I don't think they should, but they are, be it with the U.S. and China. We'll have more, though, much more on